This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Jeremy here, and guys, I'm really excited for the conversation we're going to have today because we're bringing a return guest, and uh, you guys know that's not something I do very often. There's very few people that are return guests in the show, but the guy we got today is one of the best minds that I know when it relates to education, and uh, we're going to talk about homeschooling versus public schooling. We're going to talk about socially what's kind of happening in our schools as well of, you know, kind of the direction things are going, what we need to know as parents. Our guest today is Britton Latulip. And uh, he is an expert in education, specifically homeschool education. And uh, I think we're going to have a great conversation today. So, Britton, thanks for coming back with me today, man. Absolutely. Thank you. So I want to start first and foremost for people that may not be familiar with you and what you do. Just tell us a little bit about what you guys do and uh, the impact you're making out there in the world, man. Okay. So I'm the author of the Art of Raising Children for Greatness series, which is four books. The first one is relevant to today, Revealing School. And it just... It's been a long journey, but basically I was trying to talk in the beginning about how we could fix our broken public schools by modeling them after the prep schools. And mm. then, and then I started to, to realize like, oh, this was by design. And so it turned into a very different book. And then there's three other books. They're standing at my microphone right now, so I won't show you, but uh, it's education, character, and then power. And then I'm also the president of Blue Manor Academy, and that's an online academy for homeschoolers. So mm. Very cool. And and we're going to definitely dive into quite a bit of that today. Well, the thing I wanted to start with, because I actually like, I peruse your social feeds a lot. Like so you and your wife and your team are very busy over there. Mm -hmm. So I, the thing I wanted to kind of start with is, because I hadn't looked at it like this before. Like you guys made a point. I'm like, oh man, he's right. And ta you were talking about how schools are socially conditioning kids, which I thought was very interesting. Because I think the adage you hear about like homeschool kids, right? Like that people talk about in media and things like that is like, oh, homeschool kids are so weird, right? Like they don't, you know, they're not socialized, blah, blah, blah. But me as a parent, I'm like, yes, that's why I want to homeschool my kids. I don't want them to be like your kids. So I guess like, not meaning your kids, but I mean like public school yeah, kids. Yeah. So like, I guess looking at that, like, how did you, number one, get looking into kind of the socialization aspects of this and kind of how are schools conditioning kids? Like, what do we mean by that? Okay. So first of all, there, there's a real big disconnect between what is meant like the parent means by socializing and what the school means by socializing the kids. Mm. Very different. And I started getting into it because I started homeschooling and <clears throat> I really wanted my kids to actually go to a prep school, like a boarding school that I went to, but I couldn't afford it. So I said, okay, I'm going to recreate like prep school at home for my kids. But I was very concerned about the social aspect because I was new to homeschooling. And you just keep hearing everybody talk, even homeschoolers talk about um, how we're at a disadvantage socially. And you'll hear homeschooling parents admit it a lot of times by saying, oh, like I've got my kids in Boy Scouts. I've got them on the soccer team and he goes to youth group and stuff. So he's being socialized properly. And so I just assumed that that's something that you had to do. Okay. So that, that was my assumption. And then we did an in-home school preschool for a while. My wife did. And I noticed that when the kids came into the environment, it should, they should get more mature, right? It should bolster it. Can, because... I, can I tell you something about that before you yeah, get into your preschool story? So, so you may not have experienced someone like this before. I actually got kicked out of preschool. I got asked to not return because I was like this really like precocious kid that was really interested in things. And I remember this conversation so vividly, which is shocking because I'm like, I'm 36, almost 37, I very shockingly remember this conversation with my preschool teacher about like, you know, about like how like I have to stand in line and I have to do what she says. And I have to, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I was like, it was so strange to me that that like ingrained things in my head of like, they really want to train us young. But anyway, do continue. Sorry. Yeah. And so like with the social aspect, these kids come in. So we're, we're told that, that you need to have kids in, I guess, an age segregated classroom. They have to be around their peers to socially developed. That's what's kind of assumed or implied, right? Well, I noticed that when these kids come in, all hell breaks loose, <laughs> you know, like it's total chaos and you can't properly discipline these kids because it's somebody else's kids. So I'm resorting to all these kind of like more liberal tactics and methods. And I'm just sure. like, eventually I was like, man, this is just total chaos. And when those kids would leave, <laughs> my kids would start acting better. And so I really started to question. I'm like, what are they talking about with like 
socializing kids. Like what is good about school? And I look back, I think we're very close in age. So were you, were you like there when we, we all sagged our pants to our ankles, like wore the super baggy clothes and stuff in like middle school? Oh. And, okay, or did you so just miss to, that? I'm try- so I'm trying to put this together. So like, so I was born in 87. So I'm trying to remember like the, the kind of the, the, the clothing things. So I was 85. Uh, every, everybody wore really bad jeans for a while. Like these ones that look like really dorky. Like those were super popular. And then those stupid UFO pants came in. Do you remember those things? They no. were these giant baggy pants that looked yeah. like you could like use them as a parachute. Yeah. And then there was kind of this thing where everybody wore like sports jerseys all the time and like yeah. kind of velcro their pants to their asses. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so that's what I remember. I remember <laughs> and, like, and then it went the and then it went the other way where when I got to high school, there were boys wearing tight girls' pants. So don't even get me started. Oh, I just missed that then. So when we <laughs> when we left, um, we were still wearing dressing like a gangster. And like literally it was like oh, gangster okay, cool. music. I remember that. I had to walk like I'm waddling to keep my pants up because I'd put them around my knees and wear extra large. At any rate, and I, I started thinking back to my high school days and I went to ten different schools in six different states. So I got a good some were private, some were public. And, and I got a pretty good idea of what was going on, like the socializing that was going on in that environment. And I started thinking like, what was so good about that? It was really toxic. It was degenerate. It was like, it, it was like a frat. Like when we got into high school, it was kind of like frat life. Like the way we talked, and interacted with the girls. There was nothing elevating that. It wasn't like Victorian England and we were all like these polite gentlemen properly socialized. Like it was totally- Hello, good chap. Yeah, it was like totally degenerate. So I started questioning, I'm like, what the heck is everybody talking about? And so for a while, I would just try to debunk it and be like, dude, look at the homeschool kids. They like, they act like adults. They're mature. Like they're, they're, they're not, and you could see the, the public school kids, they hit middle school and they just, you can't even talk to them anymore. So I, I, I get into that. Right. And then you start to get pushed back from the teachers. Like, well, and you start digging and they start talking about social norms and, and things like mm-hmm. that. And then I started to research for revealing school. And that's where you really start digging into what are they talking about with social conditioning, social programming, and what is the purpose and intent. And you you stumble on. And then in college, I studied this guy, Pavlot, because I wanted to be a teacher. So this is like the foundation of educational psychology. Now, I learned this in in college, but it didn't dawn on me until years later. I was just like writing it down. Like, okay, well, Pavlov. Pavlov, meaning the the bell and the dog drooling guy? Yes. So that okay. was considered the foundation of educational psychology. And when I was in college, it's like, okay, cool. Like, Interesting. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and, and it was like a breakthrough because they conditioned, it wasn't just like training a dog with food to do something. It was training an sure. abnormal response, a program response that was totally irrational. They got the dogs to drool at the sound of a bell, which makes no sense, right? So they're taking a natural stimuli and they're conditioning an unnatural programmed response and it's reflexive obedience. It's not like you tell the dog to do something and the dog thinks and decides if he wants to do it. He salivates subconsciously, subliminally. He can't help it. He salivates when he hears that bell. So this is like almost like mind control level stuff where they, yeah. they're like, we have programmed in reflexive response, a reflexive behavior. Stimul- yeah, like stimulus response, right? Like that type of thing. Yeah. The dog cannot reject. Now, mm-hmm. again, this is educational psychology, not for dog training, but for children. So they get very excited and they say, what could we do with children? Okay. We're going to program. Mm, then there's wow. another famous guy. His name is BF Skinner. Skinner does, he's kind of, if you've like positive parenting and stuff like that, it's positive reinforcement is what he kind of studied with pigeons. They use like dogs, pigeons, monkeys, things like that because they're rats, because they're intelligent like humans. Right? So yeah. with pigeons, every time a pigeon would turn left, he drops a pellet. Eventually mm. the pigeon is insane. He's spinning in circles waiting for that pellet to drop, right? They've conditioned that behavior. So now to get his food, he knows he has to spin in a circle. This is not instinctive to pigeons. So this is a conditioned, programmed, dictated behavior, if that makes sense, okay? But this is all geared yes. towards children. Remember, they're not, they don't care about pigeons. Um, then he does avoidance training. This is with the rats and he electrocutes them in the cage until they find a lever and they pull the lever. And when they pull the lever, the electrocution stops. Then he could electrocute them and they would learn that behavior. They'd run over and they'd pull the lever. Okay. That's called avoidance training. So that is what we're talking about. When we're talking about conditioning children. That's just what conditioning is. Okay. Now with children, you can't do that. You can't electrocute people's kids. You can't starve them, but there's something even more powerful. It's social, the social need. It's, it's more powerful than food. It's a spiritual need, the social condition of, of humanity. And they found that that's even more powerful. There was the Solomon Ash experiment. Have you ever heard of that one? No, I'm not. But like the thing that 
I, I want you to get to that. But the thing that came to mind for me is just like even looking at social media, right? Like, you know, you do these things, do these things, do these things for the gratification of likes and comments and whatever it may be and acceptability. It doesn't even matter if it agrees with what you believe. But anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it can become a, a type of social programming through social media for adults, right? Yeah. Well, with Solomon Ash, they realized that they can even go a step farther than programming behaviors. They can program truths. And so Solomon Ash sets up an experiment where they have a bunch of control people sitting around a table, maybe like 20 people. And then there's one college student. So this is an adult. And they bring him in and they start showing them. You've probably seen this, but they show him pictures with the straws or the lines. And he says, you're supposed to, to point to the straw that's the longest. And there's clearly, Are they all the same length? Because that would be really no, abusive. No, no. There's one, though. No, it's even worse. It's way worse. <laughs> you got to look really hard. One of them's longer. No, no. I know. They're all the same. No, it's way worse than that, okay? <laughs> one of them is longer. <clears throat> so they go around the room, and everybody's like, oh, number two. And everybody gets the answer right three or four times around the room. The guy's feeling pretty confident. He's, part, he's not a dummy. He can see the right answer just like everybody else. He's got social affirmation. Well, then they start going around the room and the other people, the control people start saying number two or number three, and they start getting the answer wrong. It's obviously wrong. It's obviously wrong. And, and the, the people get really confused. They can see that like, it's the wrong answer. They go around a few more times and they have people kind of look over, like, look at him like he's an idiot when he says the right answer. And then eventually they go around and the guy's like two, and he, he says the wrong answer. He can see with his own eyes that let's say one is the longest line. But because of the social pressure, he lies and says too, okay? And this wow. is really, really, really powerful because – They do that at entrepreneur events. Like, like let's say like, – like I don't mean entrepreneur magazine. I mean like mm -hmm. business events. Like people – like they'll have a stage speaker, right? And the stage speaker does da 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 He's like, all right, now I'm going to tell you what I'm selling, right? And then he like sells this whole stack. They'll put three or four people in the audience to jump up and say, I'm buying it. Yeah. Because then all the other people will be like, oh, and the, I want to be like that person. Mm -hmm. Like it's really messed up, man. Yeah. It, it, and sadly, I mean, it's actually powerful. It's works. It's dangerous. Okay. It is really powerful. And so these people, and here's the scary thing about a convert. Once that person buys in, there's this cognitive dissonance. They do not want to admit that they're a coward and a liar. So they really start to believe that's the right answer. And they'll defend mm. that answer. Right? Like, like you can, Oh my gosh. I've seen this so often with like, like let's say somebody's raised in a religion of, of, of any sort, right? Yeah. And then they decide later in life that like they either don't believe in that, they want to be something else. Those people are usually like super brutal to where they started out. Do you oh, get what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's, there's it's no mercy, rough, man. There's no yeah. mercy. They like they believe it and they're angry. Like they're I, angry at anyone that believes what they started life believing, which is kind of wild. Yeah, they become the most hostile. It's not the atheist, it's the convert, like the ex, you know, whatever, that ends yeah, yeah. up becoming kind of like the adversary of, let's say, the church or something. So yeah, it's a convert. Sure. So it's even more powerful. And it's even harder for him later to admit, hey, you were stupid. You were, you, you were a coward and a liar. You went along with the social pressure. So they don't know. It did look shorter or something like that. Like they'll, they'll reinforce yeah, it in yeah. their mind. So this is powerful. This is not a, a rational argument. This is merely social pressure and a few glances in your, in your direction. So they understand like we have gold here. We don't need a whip. We don't need anything. We need to harness the power of social pressure and we can condition behaviors. Okay. There was another mm. one and they said, how far will people go? Like with a line, I mean, that's, that's not that big of a deal. Like the stakes aren't that high. He's just risking foolishness a little bit. But what if his life was on the line? So there's this experiment by Zimbardo and he puts people in a control group in a, he thinks they're, they're like applying for a job in a hotel conference room. And then a kitchen fire starts and smoke starts coming out from under the door, right? So you're like, oh my God, the hotel's on fire. I got to leave. Well, the other test subjects, they kind of look at the, the, the fire and then they just go back to their business. And the, the guy's like, wait, what? Uh, and then you'd be surprised. I forget what the number it was. Like 90% of people were just went back and just went back to their work. And they're like, you would have died in that, the hotel fire. So well, just, that's even like, are you familiar with like, yeah, YouTube's going to love this one. We're going to get super weird with this one. Are you familiar with like the MK Ultra experiments and how they talk about a lot of that stuff? Like they, they would have two rooms yeah, and they would have one person in the other room where they'd be pretending to shock the other yeah, person yeah, where I, nothing would actually be hopping to them. And then somebody's in the room next to it, hearing all the screams and everything. And they get the person hearing it to do something because they think the other person's getting hurt and nothing's actually happening. It's wild what they can do to people. 
Yeah, that was like an authoritative, I think, spirit experiment. Like yeah. how far people go yeah. with authority. Um, yes. So yeah, it just shows you how much how much power that they have. Okay. And then there's another one. This is more of like, it's more of a fable, but it's based on okay. actual. Like they teach this. Okay, but it's based on um, more of like a derivative of the studies. Okay. So it's not an actual okay. study, but you have the five monkeys. Have you heard about the five monkeys and ladder? You put five monkeys in a cage, you put a ladder, you put bananas on the top of the ladder. And then basically the monkeys like start running up the ladder to get the bananas. And then you, you spray them with a fire hose. It's all oh five gosh. monkeys. Okay. So then the monkeys learn, like, don't go up the ladder. And if anybody else starts going up the ladder, they'll attack that monkey. So then they take one of the monkeys out, they put a new monkey and he doesn't know the rules. He starts going up the ladder and the other monkeys attack him. Even though it, it, now that monkey knows like, oh, I can't go up the ladder anymore. <clears throat> He's never experienced the fire hose. He just knows he doesn't go up the ladder anymore. They keep mm -hmm. taking the monkeys out and eventually there's five monkeys in the cage. They've never experienced the, the, the fire hose, but they don't go up mm -hmm. the ladder. And if anybody does, they attack them, right? Like that's social oh conditioning, gosh. right? Like that's, that's the thing. Okay. Yeah, so here's a, here's a wild one. So, um, right. We have two dozen like adult hens and I'm raising five, I guess you'd call them teenager hens. Cause they're not like babies, but they're not full grown hens. Yeah. And we put them in the barn with the other ones at night, but we put them in a crate because when they're younger, you got to worry about the rooster with the young ones. Yeah. So what we've done is we keep the, the, I could never get them in the crate. It was so hard. So what I did is I put a food bowl in front of it and they all start eating. They all start eating. What I did is I gradually kept moving the food bowl till it was inside the crate where now they just go in the crate because they're like, Oh, there's gonna be a food bowl in there. It, yeah. It's wild, man. Yeah. It's, it's wild. And it, I don't think it's so bad if, if you're a benevolent farmer, Yes. Okay. It, it, maybe it's justifiable. Um, sure. But these aren't benevolent people. Like they're conditioning us for, for their needs. Right. And that's where it gets scary. And I, I want to read this. This is, again, I wrote this book, yeah. like I wrote this book like 10 years ago or 12 or something. It's been a while. And when it first came out, everybody's like, you're crazy. And now like people have come back and been like, dude, how did you know? Because some of this stuff that's actually happening right now in the schools. And I hate to even say, it, but like the, the push for, it seems like pedophilia and stuff like that. Like I said that yeah. that was coming. People are like, you're crazy. You're fear mongering. Now they're like, dude, and, I, and it came faster than even I thought it would come. Right. But yeah, this is really important because this guy is Fitch. He, he's a, a social psychologist, a philosopher. And I, I, I just looked up the other day cause I wanted to know like, when did he write this? It was in sure. the 1700s. Oh my gosh. 1700s. And he says the social psychologist of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been charged of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. And this was written in the 1700s, guys. So they've been perfecting this model for a long time. I think maybe it was a social media thing you saw that I recorded a little bit ago, but uh, it was like, you guys, you, you had a mu you had a much different hairstyle in it, so it might have been might have been a time ago. ago. Okay, my wife's yeah, posting old videos, but I was like, you guys, we've arrived, we we've arrived. There are literally boys who think that they're girls now, and everybody went along with it, and uh, it's like they they've succeeded. There's nothing that they could they could tell you tomorrow the schools that the world is flat, mm -hmm. and then the next year they could say no, we were wrong. It's a pyramid. And everybody would believe it. I mean, it's like once this, this social conditioning is so powerful, reason doesn't thwart it. And that's why you yeah. have these men on the street. They go out there and they try to talk to these people and people get angry. They don't care. They've been socially conditioned. They don't, the, the truth is, will not penetrate them because they want to believe. It's a social thing. It's more powerful than the truth. Okay. So they got this idea that they could basically create utopia by programming children. There was one problem. You cannot program rats in the wild. You can't program pigeons in the wild. You have to have a cage. And children were out there in the wild. So how did you get them into the cage? So in the mm -hmm. 1800s, they really started to push. Same guy that was late 1700s into the early 1800s. So this is their push for this school, this utopia, enlightened utopia. They say, we'll get everybody into schools. We'll make the parents mm -hmm. hand their children over at a very early age. We'll put them in the schools and we'll, we'll program these kids. And well, you know what? So, you know, it's really interesting, even like looking at like Mao's cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things they did in, in Mao's cultural revolution was separating children from parents. And they did it by identity, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, like you want to be a red identity or a black identity. Like it's a, you, you'd pick a, the red identities or the good like communist identities you could be and the black identities or like everything else. And it's interesting because it seems like each one of these, you know, I don't know how to put this, like each one of these type of systems apply the very similar type of way of doing it, like separate kids and parents. Am, am I right? Yeah, because 
Parents are the mortal enemy of the school. Okay, the school wants to use your child as a human resource. No parent wants to use their child as a human resource because parents love their children. In this yeah. book, I, I said school is the place without love. There's no love in school. I mean, there's teachers care. My mom was a teacher. Teachers care, but it's not their system. The mm -hmm. system doesn't care about your kid, okay, like the parent does. The parent will always yes. try to promote their kid, push their kid, help their kid achieve. The, the parent truly wants what's best. The school is more about organizing society and what's best for society and not really society at whole, but the people who run the society at the top, okay? And they don't need your kid to be an Einstein or a Superman or the next Bill Gates, right? That's them. That's their job, right? Your job sure. is to go work and stock those shelves and sell those tickets and, and drive those trucks and everything. Like, that's your job. They'll take care of it. It's interesting jobs. because it seems like that's almost creating essentially like two classes of people, if that makes sense. Like it was always about, do you know what I mean? Like it's kind of like the rich, like technocratic type people and kind of everybody else. Am I, am I right in that? Yeah. So it was, that was by design from the very beginning. Okay. They have a two tiered system. I've talked about this a whole lot. That's what I wrote this book about. We have the prep mm -hmm. schools, the boarding schools, these elite boarding schools, and then you have the public school system. Okay. So their kids are going to these elite prep schools, boarding schools, and their kids are not being psychologically conditioned. Like they're being raised for greatness. They'll be the leaders. They'll be the rulers. And then hopefully these kids will be conditioned to work for them and, and, and to mm -hmm. be good employees, but never too ambitious. Okay. Or if they are ambitious, if they're ambitious to climb up your ladder to the top mm. of your ladder, but it's your ladder. Okay. You own the ladder. They'll climb it. Right. And so, yeah, it, it's absolutely it created a tier system. When I was in prep school, this is around DC in Virginia, a few hours from DC, lots of kids, you know, the ruling class, right. Sends our yeah. kids to these boarding schools. We didn't even participate. And they all seem to live in Alexandria, by the way. Anyway, continue. Yeah. We, we didn't even, um, we didn't even associate with the, the public schools. Like, Mm -hmm. When I did wrestling, we, I, I, this was a shock. They're like, well, did you win? Like later, somebody's like, well, did you win 4A or, or 3A or what, what wrestling league did you win? I didn't win. Sorry. I got third. And I, I go back. Yeah. I'm like, I don't even know. So I go back and look at the medal and it says prep league. So, and, and then I mm. started thinking about, I was like, yeah, I, we never wrestled against the public schoolers. We always had our, oh, I only wrestle against, I wrestle against public schools and, and other, other like Catholic schools. I went to Catholic school growing up. So it's, I don't know. Our school eventually got kicked out of like the league and had to go to a parochial league. Cause they're like, you guys recruit. This isn't fair. Anyway, continue. Yeah. So we, I mean, it was our own prep league. Like we didn't even associate yeah. with those people. And, and they often talk to us too about like, not blatantly, but like you guys are different. Like you guys are special. Like you guys will run society someday at a, and you knew that distinction back then. And back then as a kid, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like we're a little bit better. Then you become a parent and your kid can't join that system because tuition's fifty to $100,000 a year and you have eight kids. Then you're like, hey, because I'm a parent, I don't appreciate that system anymore. You know, like I, yes. want, I want my kids to be able to achieve and have a good life too. So the important thing was they, they had to have that cage and they had to separate the child from the need, the food source, right? A rat needs the food. Mm -hmm. If the rat can get his own food, he doesn't care about your lever. Same with the pigeon, right? And what does yeah. a child need? They need that social love, unconditional love that the parents give them. They need that. They need that. When you separate that from the child, the child feels very vulnerable. That's why a little kindergarten, he starts to cry when mommy goes away. He's scared. He's nervous. He's anxious. He realizes he's not safe anymore. Okay. So then they use that as the pellet. Okay. And they start conditioning responses. Now the child will look to the teacher, look to the system for affirmation. And the system will decide what's important. Before it was the parent. When a child does something, the parent cheers. The child knows, okay, I've done something good, right? Now the system says, this is what you'll do. And if you're good, we'll give you a golden star. If you don't do what we tell you to, you, and now the parent's in charge. It gets worse as the child gets over, older because the peers become the parents. So let me ask you this then, because I think like the thing I want to talk about is like kind of like how homeschooling is, you know, a, a way we can get around this. But at the same time, it's open to everybody, but it's not. Do you get what I'm saying? Because like, let's say like, you know, two parents are in a home, but both have to work in order to support things. So it's like, I guess, how do we approach homeschooling if we really want to do this for our kids? But we're like, you know, how do we make this attainable? Like, like, how do you kind of work around this? Right. Because I, I know for some people, it may be hard for other people if they, you know, work from home or, you know, maybe one spouse stays home, like it works. Like, how do you even start with this? And how do you work around kind of the barriers that are out there, man? Okay, you're saying if sorry, I thought I muted. Did I cough into the microphone really loud? No, nah, you're you're good. You're okay. good. Don't worry about it. I was like, oh, I was muted. Okay, so how do like a two parent home do this? Yeah, because it can be hard, right? Like maybe both parents work or a different situation. Like, how do you make these things happen, man? Okay, 
You're not going to like this answer. By the look on your face, uh, I don't think we're going to like the look. <laughs> remember the pilgrims? How they got on a boat. They like fled to England and like risk life yeah. and live and everything. Like that's more my mentality. I tell people I live under a bridge first. I will never put my kids back in the public school system. If your mm. kids are in the public school system, maybe you have to use guerrilla tactics or something like that and try to educate them on the side. And let, let me tell you, it's not a perfect system and they know it because the parents yeah. are still involved. That's why they give extra credit homework, bonuses, and then homework to fill up that void in the evening and sports on the weekends. Like they're doing everything they can to keep those kids away from the parental influence. You can still have mm. that parental influence, okay? But you're in a tug of war with the school. And the problem is these are conditioned behaviors. This is not a, a thing where you can unteach it at home because it's not an intellectual response. It's a socially conditioned response. Like the drooling dog, he has no, no say in it. So you'll develop habits. Like I tell people, like my biting my nails, I've been doing it since I was five years old. Your kids will develop patterns of behavior that have been programmed by the school. And even if they want to reject it, and even if they don't believe in it, they'll continue to act that way or they'll struggle. They'll struggle to try to get rid of them. Okay. And so at the very least, like your child has been hamstringed and their education, their youth has been stolen from them yeah. in, in many ways. So I recommend you figure out a way you, you sell a house and start there. Maybe mom can stay home that way. Or I've heard stories of like, I heard somebody, for example, that said, you know, I live in Massachusetts and the only way I'm going to make this work is they're like, screw it. I'm moving to Florida and I'll figure out how to get another job. Like, I know that's like, people may hear that and say, wow, that's really hard. I'm tied to my area. But like, if you really care about your kids, sometimes you have to figure out a different way to do things. You do whatever you have to do. And there's so many affordable options now. And now you have money given to parents sometimes by the state to educate. So there's that money available, you know, so you don't have to pay for it all on your own. And there's affordable options like Blue Man Academy is $25 a month. It's, it's not really that expensive. Maybe mom or dad works a part-time job on a different shift and split shift. Like I would say it's that important. You do whatever it takes to get your kids out of that system. And then you'll do very well. We're thriving in the homeschool world. We're doing very well over here. And, and it'll be worth it in the long run, but it'll be hard. I don't know. Every situation is different, but you'll have to find a way. Yes. Um, Let me ask you this then, because I know something that you guys have promoted a lot on social media. I actually really appreciate it. It's been a help to us is bringing kind of homeschooling into your life. And I, I think people don't consider it like, all right, it's school time now. We sit down, we do this because that's how we've been trained. Like that's how we've been trained to, to kind of operate. And one of the things that we've started doing, because I've kind of picked up what you talk about with your kids is like, for example, like, you know, my daughter goes out to the barn with me every night and she's four years old and we come back with all the eggs and she counts the eggs for me and we let her we figure out how many we need in the dozen and how many is in a dozen. And like, I think figuring out things like that is really important to figure out how to make everything like a learning opportunity. So how do you kind of bring it into your daily life? So it's not just like, all right, it's school time now. Like, how do you make homeschool kind of a life thing? Yeah, I think that's so important. So many people, as soon as they start homeschooling, they recreate school at home. And then it ends up being the same drag in a lot of ways as home. So all parents are always like, well, how do you motivate your kids and all this stuff? I'm like, I don't have to. What are, you, what are you talking about? Here's basically what we do. We use Blue Manor Academy for the academic stuff for a few hours in the morning. Okay. And then after that, our children do independent studies largely. They can study whatever they want. So it's like, it's kind of a mix of schooling and unschooling, right? And they have their own passions. Like my daughter at a very early age, she wanted to be an artist. And we condone that. And I said, if you want to be an artist, you're going to have to be one of the greatest in the world because it's super hard out there. Now there's AI art, right? It's even harder for you. Yeah. You're going to have to be really good. So she probably does five to six hours of art a day. And at 14, she's professional. She's a professional wow. lover, okay? And she That's absolutely cool. loves it. Am I teaching her? No. There's so much educational resources and YouTube and all sorts of stuff. And she has books, you know, that, and she studies the masters, which is available to everybody. Like you want to be learn about art, go watch the Disney movies. They mastered it back in the day, okay? They mastered art. So- that's kind of how we approach it. And then we have a family business, right? Or we're into real estate. My kids know they learn math and they know about wealth from our own wealth. I show them the books. Here's where we're at. Here's what our debt is. And they watch that. So it's real to them. And if we go look at real estate, we would take our kids there and we talk about the property. Is this a good property? Yeah, it's really good. It's a great deal, but it's in the wrong area of town. See how nice this house is? So we're teaching them in just in our daily life. Like you said, going out to the chicken coop. The other cool thing is, is if you have siblings, they teach each other. So now I have my older kids teaching the younger kids and they're reinforcing what they're learning and learning it even better because that's the highest form of teaching is or learning is teaching. So they really master it by teaching the younger ones. They reinforce it for themselves. And then the younger mm -hmm. ones get the benefit of being taught. They're like working together. You, we go to a chess tournament. I taught my oldest one chess. She won the state championship in Idaho. Right. And then after that, wow. I said, um, next year, I don't care if you win. I mean, win, that's great, but you get a double scoop of ice cream. If you can lead your siblings to victory. 
So you lead your brother and sister. If they win the state championship for their grade, then you are have succeeded as a leader and a coach. So she's that's is a huge thing for her to learn. It's one thing to learn chess and lead yourself to victory. Now can you lead a team? And her yeah. the next year her brother won the state championship. Her sister got third or second. I forget. I was like, that's pretty good, okay? The next year, they all three won the state championship for the grade in Idaho. So it's, it's a huge thing, right? So they're learning yeah. leadership, and they're independent up there. They collaborate together. My son's a coder. He's coding video games right now for Blue Manor Academy. So we're like wow. working together, and it's adult stuff. Like I can yeah. publish it. The coders were like, dude, this, this is amazing. How old is he? I'm like, he's 11. So you can do it. It's like we don't sit down like a classroom for eight hours a day. I don't even know what they're doing sometimes. You know, She's out working mm-hmm. in the garden or something. They're learning organically like you would think. And we don't have to teach them every single lesson. They can learn from each other. They can learn from other people. They can learn from books. They can learn from YouTube. It's all over. So my kids look forward to their day. They're very excited to pursue like their dreams. They're, you know what I mean? Yeah. So let me ask you this. Like the only reason I ever got through math is, and I don't know how this happened in life. Somehow my wrestling coaches were always my math teachers. So they were like, if you're going to wrestle, you got to pass math. Like that was always my thing. So like, you know, as an adult, I'm okay at it, but like, don't ask me to do anything past like algebra or something like that. So I guess like when we're looking at that, like what happens is like as a parent, we're like weak in a certain study area. Like how do we help our kids if they need help? Right. Cause kids do struggle. Maybe there's something not understanding and we want to make sure they get through it. Like how do we handle a situation like that if they're homeschooling? Okay. So I have two, I have two things. Remind me, I have two things on this. Okay. Because I do want to answer that question. But before we okay, answer cool. that question, okay, actually, I'll answer it the other way around. I'll answer your question first. Then I, I want to make a second <laughs> point, okay? So let's say there's something you, you have to teach your kids you don't know how to teach, okay? A perfect example, my son, Colton. We needed a coder for Blue Manor Academy, and he was really interested in coding. And I don't understand. To this day, I even sat in on his coding classes. He, he leads a coding club. And I still can't. Yeah. Like we ha- I had to stop because the kids went ahead without me. I don't understand it. Oh, I can teach you C++, baby. I got this. Anyway, oh, go ahead. yeah. And he, he wrote a whole game in C Sharp, right? C++? Yeah. And, and then the coders are like, oh, we'd have to have a separate server for that. So you have to convert it to Python. One of the, not Python. I forget. Oh, is it like Java. Ruby on Rails or one of those? It's JavaScript. Java. JavaScript. Okay. And so he's like, oh, that's super hard. Anyway, he had to convert it to that. So he's really advanced, but it's very, all over my head. I have no idea, right? Yeah. It's like you live in the information age. He goes mm-hmm. online. And this is probably even more important than learning how to code. He's learned how to solve his problems. So in the beginning, yeah. I said, I want you to start, you know, like, I don't even know That's where something to start. I value an employee, by the way, because I think a lot of times employees will come to you like, oh, I have this problem. Can you solve it for me? I'm like, well, how would you solve that problem? Like, that's really valuable when you're trying to like do something later in life. Yeah. And I, I wish I could bring him on too, because he was like, the hardest part was learning how to start because there's all these coding tutorials, but you can't find the first lesson. It assumes that you mm. know all this other stuff. He's like, so where do you start? So he said it took him about two months. And then he finally found where to start and how to download a tester. That was the thing he was missing. He would talk about coding, but he didn't know he had to have a, where do you do this? Where do you even type the code in? Like, you know, like if you're not on a little kid site. So, and then once he figured that out and he found out how to solve his answers, there's every day he's all by himself. He'll run into something he doesn't know how to do. And he goes searching and he goes, you know, searching, searching YouTube or something like that, or Googling it, or he can ask certain people or he asks the other coders or something like that. And he solves his own problems. That's like I said, almost more important skill than the coding, like learning how to solve your own problems. So I'll say that with math or anything like that, there's a thousand resources out there that are free. And instead of you putting Mm -hmm. the burden of your kid's education on your shoulders, I tell my kids this all the time. I'm like, you know what? Like, this is your problem. If you want to be great, I can't drag you there. If you want to be the greatest artist in the world, I can't sit here, crack a whip for you. You have to want it more than I want it for you. Yes. And so once the kid and is I have to, fire, I have to say this because I know my YouTube audience is going to roast me. So it sounds like your, well, your son knows how to like code useful applications. And I just know how to code websites. So I couldn't be very useful to you. But anyway, uh-oh. continue. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd ask you when it comes to math, and this gets me so much trouble, okay? Especially leading Blue Banner Academy like his president because we're trying to be efficient and not follow the public yeah. school model. I always ask you, Okay, you said you know to what? Like, what did you take? What's the highest level you took? Calculus, and I took pre cal and calculus. It's funny because I say I'm an idiot when it comes to math. I'm actually really smart when it comes to math. I just need a lot of help to figure out how to do things. Like, I found the actual learning of it and implementation hard, but I got really good at math. But obviously, it took me a lot of help to get there, is my point. Yeah. So you, you know what I'm saying? Like, whereas, oh, yeah, whereas, yeah, some kids do, could, whereas some kids could sit there and get the whole thing, I needed somebody to sit down with me, work it out with me, find out the things I don't understand, and kind of work it through with me. Like, I needed that extra help. Yeah. 
So it's funny too, because I was like gifted in math and I, I was like amazing at math until calculus. And then I'm like, I am so dumb at math. I never really grasped calculus. It was always a struggle for me, like horrible. Like I went from feeling like a genius in math to me, like, you know, I was like, I have to re-examine that and say, why did I take calculus? Did I need calculus? In my whole entire life, have I ever used calculus? And you know what else? In my, in my whole life, have I, have I used calculus? Would I need calculus? And could I even solve a calculus problem today if one was presented to me? Because I feel like I've forgotten all of it. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a question I'd ask most homeschoolers. They're like, well, what if I can't solve this? I'm like, why can't you solve it? Well, I haven't done it in 20 years. Exactly. You haven't done it in yeah. 20 years because you didn't need it. If your kid wants to be an engineer, he should go down that route. He should take calculus and all the math he ever needs, okay? And he can sure. teach himself. There's tons of tutors out there and books and all sorts of stuff, right? But – like I use proportions a lot as an adult. Like I'm able to figure out things like I use proportions for a lot of different things in life, but like can most calculus, I don't use it. Okay. Yeah. And percentages is so funny. I took a real estate class a long time ago and nobody knew how to solve percents except for me and like one other person. Nobody mm -hmm. could figure out a percentage and they're like 50, 60 years old. Okay. And then, so two things, one, the education system failed them because they probably took up to calculus and they can't even solve a percent. So that should tell you something. And then secondly, do you know how long it took them to learn percents when they needed it? About 20 minutes. Wow. So it's like, it's not that big of a deal. If you need the calculus someday, you can go back and get the calculus if you really need it. It's not that detrimental. But what we tell children to focus on is first of all, the subjects of greatness and then their career path. And then I would tie everything into that career path. Like Colton wants to do math or coding. So there's math involved in that. So instead of going and getting a generic math book like Trig, he does the math associated with coding and he learns math that way. There's certain math involved mm -hmm. in art, like with proportions, like you talked about and angles and stuff that we talk about with our daughter with. And that's how she's learning math. One of the things we do in Blue Manor Academy, probably the most important thing, you, you get to eighth grade, they're like, well, where's algebra, pre-algebra? It's like, okay, we'll teach some of that. Okay. But we have, it's called mortgage math. Probably one of the most interesting class and one of the most necessary class. When it comes to your mortgages, that will be that's the biggest eater of your wealth that you can fathom. I'd say it's more important than any math you could ever do. You have to understand mortgage math and how it amortization happens over time. In the first seven mm -hmm. years, all that interest is front loaded and people don't understand that, right? Or tax math. So we teach math. I, I've been trying to re learn federal reserve math, but apparently oh, you have yes. to know somebody to learn yeah, that one. It's like a secret. <laughs> so we're learning all this math that we could never use. And then the math that's like detrimental to us that we have to know, we never yeah. learn. And so mm. I would recommend like rethinking it too. Does my kid need to know this? Is there a better way to teach this? Like you're teaching when you go get the eggs and it makes sense and it's useful. You're teaching about a dozen, right? My kids are going to be getting a mortgage pretty soon here. Like 18, 20, right? They get their first house hopefully. And they need to understand the math of that because the difference in a half percent or percent could cost them a fortune over time. Or if they sell houses, mm. they keep upgrading. It's like every time you sell a house, you lose a huge chunk. Here's how much you lose between the realtor mm -hmm. fees and the closing costs and the rollover on the next house, like you're losing a ton of money. It's better to buy the house and hold it for a long time. And that's how we created mm -hmm. our wealth. Absolutely. It wasn't even through business. Business has been brutal, but through real estate, it, it was so easy. You just bought a house, mm -hmm. moved every two years and you held the house and rented it. And in the beginning it was tight with inflation. We just mm -hmm. killed it over time. Mm -hmm. And so we teach that to our kids. Like that's useful math, right? That'll empower you. That'll yeah. make you rich. That algebra that I learned was okay. Like calculus, I hate it. It probably made me stupider. I'm sorry. Like I, by the end of it, I lost all my confidence in math. I'm like, I don't even, I don't even know what to oh do gosh. with it. What do you do with calculus? And I sat through the class like for a year, right? But I don't even know how to yeah. use it. So. so when I asked you that question, you said, okay, I'm going to answer your question, but wait, no, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to tell you something else. So what was the other okay. thing you were going to say and then you decided not to say? That was the other thing. The first thing was, it's not that hard. You don't have to teach them calculus. If you want your kid to learn calculus, there's a thousand resources that are free even online on YouTube or something like that. If your kid is motivated and needs to learn calculus, he'll learn it. Like mm -hmm. the second thing is rethink, does he need to know this? Because if you've mm -hmm. never used it in your whole life calculus and you're just doing it to check the block because the public school system does it and the public yeah. school system is the worst model to follow. Just look at, look at, look at what's going on there. Okay. So mm -hmm. that was the second thing is like rethink. Do you even need to teach this? Have you ever mm -hmm. used this in your life? And I would generally say parents have a pretty good idea. We're middle-aged, right? We're like in our 30s and stuff. We have a pretty good idea. Come on. I'm going to live to be more than 70, man. Okay, Jesus, I know. Don't make me, middle, me middle-aged now. I'm Come approaching on now. 40 and I'm starting to try to like realize, you know, just it's sinking in. <laughs>
It is painful, but I'm 38. So, okay, you got two years on me. So there you go. We, yeah, we have a pretty good idea what it takes to make it out there in the real world. Yes. We've been in the real world for a while. We know what it takes. We can start thinking this through. The public school system is not the real world. Their subjects are not the most important subjects in the world. Okay. So I would say that, like, think it through. Mm -hmm. Are you just checking the block? Do you even know why your kid needs to take trigonometry? Mm -hmm. So that was my second so, answer. So Britton, let me ask you this, because I think like, it's important, like as parents that love our kids, we want to take responsibility for our kids and everything else. Like, here's my struggle, right? And I think you see this a lot in higher education. People are saying like, you know, do I reform the college I'm in? Or do I start a new college that's going to compete with it or whatever it may be, right? Like, because it's like without competition, something's not going to improve, but without improving the thing, the thing's not going to improve. So I guess like, like, how do you approach that? Like, how do we approach helping our kids, but also reforming the system to help other people's kids? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Because I think like we want to help our own kids, but we don't want it to just be about us. Like, like, how do we, what do we do system wise? Okay. So that's the thing. It's like, okay, we can homeschool, but maybe some of those people are stuck in the system. So let's fix right, that Right. Like there, there's parents that that's just not an opportunity for them. And we like, they could be sending their kids to the wolves, you know? Yeah. But here's the question. It's like, how do you make arsenic palatable? Put it in peanut butter? I don't know. Well, it's, it's poison. That's the point. It's like, it's poison. Like, do you reform? <laughs> like, I think that the way to save people's children is to bring them out of that system, pull them out of the cage. The children, and I was going to get to this later, but okay. Yeah. That system is designed to be a cage. It's designed to separate a child from their natural environment and the love, the unconditional love that they thrive in. And it's designed to do that purpose, to make an incision in the family, to destroy the family, right? That system is not perfect. It's not perfectly conditioning. Okay. It is very good at conditioning behaviors. It succeeded in that. It conditions behaviors and truths very, very, very well. But what it hasn't done has spiritually, it's destroyed children. So I'll give you one example. There's this phenomenon of these parrots. Okay, I read about it. In a cage, they'll rip their feathers out. So they go crazy. They just start ripping their feathers out and gnawing on their skin. And the girl who had studied this, she said, you never see that in the wild. So you see parrots out there flying in the wild. You never see them missing their feathers. When they get put in that cage, it drives them insane. Like these wow. pigeons who are spinning in circles, you might condition the behavior, but it also might drive them crazy. And you see these kids in school, they're being driven crazy. They're being conditioned to behaviors, but they're going crazy. Yeah, I did this really weird thing when I was in grammar school that when I got like kind of out of public school, I stopped doing, I was like pulling my like eyelashes out. Like it was weird as shit, but like we got that handle when I got out of public school. Yeah, you see this also, this kind of spiritual deterioration in prisons. So incarcerated, these children are incarcerated and they're doing things that is self-destructive because they're miserable. Okay, they're absolutely mm. miserable. So it's like you cannot. It's almost like you try to go for something you can control. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and am, am I right? Yeah. Well, I think it's more like a child needs a family. He, they need a mother and a father. They need their siblings. They need that unconditional love to really thrive in. And that school system is so sterile and so brutal. And the peers are so brutal. Like you don't care if your kid dresses a little silly. You're not going to be like, you stupid, you loser, push them into a locker. Like it becomes a very right. toxic environment for a lot of these kids and it, it's killing them. Or they're becoming so angry they kill somebody else. We had a, you know, a family member that committed suicide. She was 13 years old. That is not oh normal. Gosh. That is not normal. And let me tell you, I didn't even talk about this before, but there's no such thing as adolescent upheaval. There's no such thing as adolescence, really. You actually become an adult when you're 13. Through puberty, whatever you want to say, either by design or through right. evolution, you basically become a young adult at 13. And they extended the cage because they realized, okay, in the beginning, they wanted you from seven to 13, because it was an academic education. You pass into the age of reason at seven and you become an adult at 13. So the state has no right to incarcerate you after 13. That was the thinking. Mm -hmm. But then they said- That's really interesting too. Cause even if you look at like work a hundred years ago, right? Like somebody was a man at 16. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at it now and it's like, you got kids that are like living with their parents to like 35 and you're like, wow, that's really, or, or even like the Affordable Care Act, you have people that are like on their parents' insurance till they're 27. It's like, that's insane. Yeah, they, they've extended childhood. and. So this is, has to do with social conditioning. They said, okay, we need children before they enter the age of reason because that's prime. You get kids in kindergarten, they will believe anything we tell them. It's even easier, right? It's a golden mm -hmm. error that's been given to you, I believe, by God to really like set your children up. Like what you say is law, almost like God when they're that young. Then they hit this age of reason and they start to question things from seven to 13. 
And then 13, they really enter adulthood. And they said, if we want to condition people, that we need to condition them in all stages. We need them prior to the age of reason from five to seven. And then we need them after the age of reason when they have all those hormonal, the programming, your natural programming kicks in with the hormones and stuff like that, right? And it, it alters you when you hit puberty. And they said, well, we can't just condition them as children because they're, they change. So we need to post puberty condition these people or, or post childhood, right? So now they condition mm -hmm. them until they're 18. 18 years old. And this was totally made up by Stanley Hall. And he invented adolescence essentially. And it was based on the evolutionary theory of recapitulation, which is totally stupid and debunked now. But they used to believe that you went through all the stages of evolution in your mother's womb. So you start off as amoeba and they become like a fish. And they used to believe you had gills, but that now they know that was just your ear canal. This was debunked in the 1890s, but they're still teaching it. I was just in the army special forces qualification course. I was in class studying Chinese with a guy from West Point. And he's like, what? And he like started talking about evolution and recapitulation. I'm like, you believe that? And he's like, yeah. He, like he learned it at Harvard or uh, excuse me, at West Point. And I was like, yeah. dude. And I, he, I could not convince him it was wrong until I brought a, a paper in from a Harvard biologist who's like, You're, these people are making evolutionists look stupid because they're still teaching recapitulation. You're never a fish in your mom's womb. Okay. You're always a human being. Okay. All the way through. But what they said is you went through that and then when you're born, you're basically like a chimp and then you grow in through the stages. And then when you hit puberty, you become a Neanderthal stage. So you're like, like running and growing and you're all about sex and food and all that stuff. And then they say you finally fully develop into a human being around the age of like a homo sapien around the age of 20. So they justified, wow. Hey, since these aren't fully developed people yet, human adults, we can incarcerate them until they're 18 and continue the conditioning process. It doesn't matter that this theory is totally debunked. Everybody still believes it. And mm -hmm. so they, th when they see these children pulling out their feathers because they're going insane in the public school system, they just think it's adolescent upheaval. <laughs> That's just totally normal. It's like, no dude, because we don't see that in the homeschool world. None of the homeschool kids, unless they came out of the public school system, brought that drama with them. But these homeschool kids aren't doing that. They're not cutting themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not committing suicide. They're not shooting each other up. Like that is a product of the prison that you've got those kids in. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely does, man. This is this has been really, really insightful. I'm like super glad we we dove into this today, man. Like I learned a lot. I, mean, I know we had like internet trouble trying to make this whole thing happen, and we finally got it happen, man. And I think everything happens for a reason. And this is the conversation we were originally meant to have. So for awesome. people listening, man, if they want to find out more about you, more about Blue Manor Academy, or, or kind of connect with you guys, how's gonna be the best way for our people listening to do that, man? Okay, okay, probably um, you can join Blue Manor Academy. We have preschool through sixth grade. And just look up Blue Manor Academy. And then, you know, I sell my books on Amazon and it's just called, you know, it's Britain La Tulip and then the Raising Children for Greatness series. And let me just show you real quick. Yeah, man. Again, um, this is revealing school. This is what we talked about today. It's only 450 oh, wow. pages. Okay. Tracing the, like the roots of school all the way back to the Babylonians and, and Alexander the Great and all those guys. Okay. And how it's always been about harnessing other people's children is your resources, mm -hmm. character, homeschoolers today and in the public school, it's all about raising these like nice nerds, like nice nerd kids. That's not what we're after. We're after kingly character. That's what we want. Like powerful kingly characters. That's what we talk about. And then education, how to give your kids an elite education. And then the last one that is the hallmark of Blue Man Academy and our movement is power. And it's how to teach your children the subjects of power so that they can rule the world. We can, we can fight this evil back into the darkness. Okay. Very cool. Well, Britton LaTulip, thanks for coming back on today, man. We'll have to have you on again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you later.